gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that uh, musical interlude to get you into the mood for this presentation, or at least potentially wake you up if you haven't had enough coffee this morning. Um, this is Why Can't We Be Friends? Making Drupal Play Nice with Content Authors. My name is Danielle Lorette, and I am your friendly neighborhood content strategist. Um, is anybody else here in a heavily content-related role? Okay, a couple people, excellent. I mean, that, technically that's everybody, as we saw with Todd's talk, but um, uh, I'm often a lone content strategist at these things, so I always kind of like to see if there's any, any of my people, but I do really want to convince everybody that we need to take a content-first approach. Yep. Hi, I'm David Pasquilari. I'm the CEO of Coldfront Labs. Um, and uh, I roped you into doing this. You roped me into doing this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, so we wanted to take a look at, uh, well, I guess we'll get into that. But uh, yeah, so I'll be handling the technical aspects of things. Do you want to do the next couple slides, too? The next couple slides. Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, yeah, I guess about Coldfront Labs. Um, so we build a Drupal applications for a whole variety of cl clients from a lot in the public sector, and, uh, but really for any kind of businesses and sectors across North America. Um, it's, uh, but, all right, is, is, do you want me to do this one? Doesn't matter. This one? All right. So we'll get into, uh, actually, the meat of our talk. So we're first going to clarify what this talk isn't going to be about, um, which is what traditionally sort of content authoring talks have been about regarding Drupal. And it's not going to be about configuring WYSIWYG editors. <laughs> um, which Suzanne from Wallywag has an amazing talk about. So if that's what you came here looking for, I highly recommend her talk. It's on YouTube, um, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. And if you want to see some really, really weird things happen with WYSIWYG editors, come to my other talk about uh, building impossible applications with Drupal and VJS, uh, where we build probably the strangest WYSIWYG editor that you'll ever see. <laughs> so here's what we are going to talk about today. Yeah. So first, I'm just going to give you a content strategy uh, 101. What is it and why does it matter? Because the, the varying levels of understanding of content strategy in this room, I just want to clarify. And also, content strategy is a little confused about what it is right now. Um, I don't know if anybody went to or followed uh, Confab that just happened in Minneapolis. It's like the big content strategy conference. And there's even conflicting definitions of it within that conference. So I just wanted to let you know my working definition and why I think it, since it matters to all web projects. Um, and then we're going to talk specifically, specifically about content style guides. Most of you are familiar with design style guides, but I want to sort of drive home a point about content style guides, and then Dave's going to help us talk about... So I'm going to talk about uh, how do we implement that in Drupal, and how do we do that in the, uh, sort of the, the most straightforward and easiest way like, possible. So how can we get up and running um, with these topics, or bring these topics to your content authors without needing any, any other major requirements. Cool. All right, so content strategy 101. Um, the definition that I like to work with with content strategy is content strategy is the guiding is guiding the creation, delivery, and governance of useful and usable content. And I do want to distinguish this from content marketing. Content marketing often sort of functions as content for the sake of content. You're trying to drive users in with your content. Uh, I like to think of content strategy in its truest incarnation to be very user focused. So you really have to know your user stories inside and out and what your users want and deliver it to them first and foremost before your marketing sizzle, if you will. So content strategy is it's not content marketing and it's not design incarnation that we know it, but it's really interested in what kind of content, why it's there, how it's going to be developed, when is it going to be published, whom is it going to be written for, what resources and workflows are we going to use, how often will we publish, and then looking at that content life cycle and operations in your organization. So I've drawn some of you here today with the promise of Scott Punk references. Uh, can I get a show of hands for those of you who like that was like a deciding factor? Todd, <laughs> Todd's my man, up front, my one more. Excellent. So um, content strategists are just like ska punk bands. We took really nerdy skills from high school and figured out how to apply them in another context. For ska musicians, this was, you know, they were assigned a trombone or a saxophone in grade 9 music class, but they wanted to rock, but they knew how to play the trombone, and they're like, I can make this work, right? Content strategists 
are like this, but we're grammar nerds and organizational nerds. And we, we figured out a way to apply this in a way that was unconventional. So I feel very akin to, uh, to Scott Vance. <laughs> but I also listened to a lot of them in high school, so this is just really fun for me. Um, and there'll be per- throughout in our little demo, we'll have a little Scott feel for those who are here for that reason. So I want to talk about the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is not Scott. The elephant in the room is content. Um, and I really appreciated Todd's keynote this morning because it was just like this perfect precursor to a lot of things that me and Dave want to hit home with. And I think there's a lot of changes happening. But if you look back to uh, Christina Halverson, who's kind of like the content person, she wrote content strategy for the web. She wrote a list of her article in 2008. Um, just basically talking about there's this giant elephant in the room called content that no one is talking about. We're talking about design, we're talking about code, we're talking about functionality, and we're saying the client will handle content, right? And you sort of end up having them drowning in this massive thing without very little direction. I don't want you to read this entire thing. I know I'm breaking the cardinal rule of PowerPoint slides, but this is from her article, and I just like the blue parts where we think, we the people who make websites we're rather quiet on the matter of content. The client can do it. But you think it's a coincidence then that web content is, for the most part, pardon me, crap. Um, content is the web. It deserves our time and attention. And we have to stop thinking that the client will just do it by themselves. They can't wrangle this elephant all alone. It's just too big. There's been a lot of advancement. Uh, DrupalCon Seattle had a, a content track this, this time. It was awesome. Um, there was an amazing keynote this morning with a focus, and content strategists are finally being integrated into web development projects at the beginning as opposed to at the end as sort of a saving grace. So I think we've made a lot of headway. Has anyone seen this graphic before? Or a variation of it? Yay! You're all content quadrigens. I'm so excited. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> The content strategy quad. This is a graphic representation of the work that I do every day. And these are the four four places that I focus my attention and my advice uh, to clients. So these four sectors are essentially editorial experience, structure, and process. And they all have different characteristics, but they all work together. And you'll notice that structure and process are on the bottom Um, because they are the foundation of content. But here's the tricky thing. Structure and process often have to do with corporate culture, people, and workflows. And editorial and experience rise above that. And that's where we often try to change things. Like we'll come up with a content style guide or we'll think about a new content type. But we have to really understand that if we're going to create change in the upper part of the quadrant, we really have to analyze and look at what needs to change in the bottom of the quadrant. So editorial is really focused on how do we know that this is the right content and right thinking a lot of different things. Experience is what do our users need? What are they looking for? What is the experience they're driving towards? Structure is how are we doing, um, how are we doing to organize and engineer the content and make it right for our users? That's sort of that, that content design or content engineering uh, aspect. And then process is how will this be created and maintained from a content operations workflow perspective within the organization. Um, and like I said, we often get really obsessed with the blue section at the top, but if there's problems in, in the bottom foundation, change won't really happen. I also like to clarify that content strategy does not equal design. I think everyone in the room here today knows that, but so often I will walk into meetings with clients and people want to talk about the color of the font, or the type, the style of the font, or the images that are in the background. Um, content strategy, you know, we have to play really nice with web designers and, and UX experts. But that's not really what we do. We're very uh, consumed with the content assets, um, which is the the core writing and and images that are part of that asset. And as I said, we tend to get really wrapped up in the functionality and web development aspect of of developing a site. But this is my one off-brand meme. But um, everything the light touches is content. It kind of, not that it doesn't matter how good your site is, but you can develop and code and design the most robust CMS ever. But if your client isn't guided into putting appropriate content in it, your functionality is not going to shine. Um, So from a development perspective, it doesn't matter how awesome your code is. If the content you put into it is broken, inconsistent, and haphazard, the site will be viewed as such. And this all sort of ties into the concept of the reservoir of goodwill. Anyone heard this term before? 
but I can't get more hands. I love it. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> um, so this is a concept from uh, Don't Make Me Think, which is a really great UX book um, by Steve Krug, and he talks about how as we enter a website, we start with a reservoir of goodwill. We're excited to get the information that we're going in to get, and we believe that we can achieve it. Okay? And as we go through the website, everything we encounter that makes that process difficult, go ahead, um, brings down that reservoir of goodwill and makes us cranky, okay? which makes us cranky towards the organization in part. And this isn't all content, but for a lot of it, um, content that's out of date, inconsistent, right? Every one page and it has a completely different tone than another page. I may be hiding the information that the user wants behind some marketing sizzle or a million pop-ups about, I want your email address and by the way, we use cookies and here's the 800 things I'm going to show you before I get you get to where you want to go. This really drains our reservoir of goodwill. But we can keep it full by making sure that our content is up to date and that we're making sure that we have a content operations model that allows us to make sure everything is up to date. Um, and then it answers user needs. Again, not content for the sake of content, but then it actually focuses on the main user stories of what brings people to your website. We also want to ensure the style and tone are appropriate and consistent. Appropriate means knowing our audience inside and out and speaking to them in a language, vernacular, and style that is acceptable for the web and also individualized to them in some way. And we also want to make sure that that structure is intuitive and consistent because if it looks one way on one page and one in another, I'm going to be confused as a user if I'm looking at the same type of content. So, one thing you can do to, to moderate this is to make a content style guide. Um, so a content style guide is an organized set of rules for writing for your organization. These rules uphold your organization's voice, style, and message. I want to say, a content style guide is not going to fix everything. Okay? It does sit in that blue portion of the quad. It is an editorial thing, but if you've got no content strategy at all and you're in a position where you're not likely to upheave the entire organizational workflow, it's something you can do tangibly as an individual. And anybody can do this um, as long as you've been through high school English. Um, so it's just sort of like one thing to start with to br bring through a consistency through your site. So, but here's the thing. Design style guides are sexy, right? You get to look at colors and fonts, and everybody wants to be in the meeting where you decide on the website's design. Um, content style guides are kind of like homework. I'm not going to lie to you, okay? We're looking at consistency in writing style. We can talk about things like punctuation, talk about, talk about things like formatting, title case versus sentence case. Sentence case. It's not sexy, I'm not going to lie to you, but it's going to make that reservoir of goodwill um, stay fuller longer, just on a subconscious level. Okay? So you're thinking, okay, you sold me a little bit, maybe I'll put together a content style guide. Here's the secret, you don't even necessarily have to. There's a lot of great public-facing content style guides that you can kind of beg, borrow, and steal from. So the big one that most people know is Canada.ca. Right? Their style guide is completely public-facing, it's very robust, um, so it might be a little bit too much for your organization, but if you are a uh, an organization that has to disseminate large amounts of information, somebody else has figured this out for you. And I know it's not perfect, right? But it's there it's as a resource like to... <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'll explain later. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not perfect, but it, it is a starting point, And it, it has a lot of great uh, examples of just ways that you can uh, standardize your content. This is a lot though. So what I recommend is if you are thinking of jumping into this and making a content style guide, there's a great one from the University of Dundee. There is this like wave of content strategy going through the UK right now that I'm so envious of. Content strategists have like taken hold of the web in Britain and it's awesome. Um, and things are getting to be really clear and concise. And what I love about the University of Dundee style guide is that it's super short, it's effective, um, and they've broken it down into four areas that you can sort of replicate really easily. So we go to the next slide. These are their four areas, and I really like them. So you have your content principles, which is sort of an overview of how your organization writes. This is, I don't want to call it a mission statement, because mission statements are fluffy. There, if you had to like, after you're done writing the entire style guide, you come back and say, okay, if I had to have seven, seven, three short sentences, what would they be, okay? Um, I'll go through some examples afterwards. Voice and tone, I'll distinguish what those are, because I know we don't all remember grade 10 English class, but they are different. 
Um, the writing guidelines, the best practices we use when we're creating copy, and then a reference guide, which basically becomes this little mini encyclopedia about formatting. So first, for content principles. Content principles, nope, sorry. that's okay. We define our audience, so who are we speaking to specifically? Um, so for example, right now I'm working on a project in higher education, and we've segmented out the site in a user-focused in a user -focused way. So the style guide for the way that we write to prospective students who are coming out of high school, versus the way that we're gonna speak to uh, clients who are coming in from uh, for professional development services, that it's going to be very, very different. So we define that audience first in our content principles. From there, we sort of have those three short statements that talk about, uh, that's okay, um, the three overarching content statements that sort of lead us. So if your content authors aren't gonna go and refer to your style guide, um, they can just have these sort of three mantras, if you will, about how to write content. So it might be things like keep it simple, but don't patronize. Um, show as well as tell. They're really high level, and this is short, okay? I'm actually petitioning you for like a four page content style guide. That's it, it should be tiny. So voice and tone, this one gets confusing for people. Voice is your fixed personality as an organization, and the tone is how it changes depending on the specific interaction or situation. And it's rooted in your voice, but it adapts the same way each of us do. Our voice is our personality, you are who you are. But the tone you take when you're speaking to your grandmother versus when you're presenting at a conference are gonna be very, very different. So to establish your voice, a really simple and easy trick if your organization doesn't already sort of have this in their marketing objectives is to make blank but not blank statements. Okay? So you might say that we're resourceful but not boring. We're playful but not immature. And that'll sort of help people qualify the, the voice that they should be using as they're writing. So once you establish voice, you can jump into tone. And this is actually sort of a, a, a five point scale that if you don't even want to think through other adjectives, if you pick one of the two in all of these, you can establish your tone for any given specific piece of content. So you might look at a, a Facebook post for your organization and say, this should probably be personal as opposed to professional. Um, it should probably be accessible as opposed to exclusive. This is probably enthusiastic because you're probably trying to rope people in. Maybe a little bit funny for this one, and then conversational. Whereas if your organization is writing the actual document on the site that's answering the user need, perhaps it more as a, has a more professional, accessible, matter of fact, serious, formal tone, if you will. And when you build out your style guide, what you really want to look at is all the different content types that you have and attribute an intended readership for all of them, a tone that you are expecting, and then a small example of the copy, a couple little sentences to help you out. The next section is the writing guidelines, and I swear I'm going to get back to Drupal very shortly, okay? <laughs> is to sort of create uh, guidelines about all of those things that we're not sure about when we start writing. So something as simple as active and passive voice. Um, generally, we write in the active tense, and that's going to make it more actionable. But should we be writing in the second, third, or first person? Is this an I situation, a you situation, so that I'm engaging and bringing you in, or a third person or move situation, so that it's quite formal? We'll also talk about header guidelines or what sort of capitalization we're going to use, your paragraphic guidelines, and examples of well-written copy of each. And the last one is sort of formatting expectations. So this is the really dry part, not going to lie, but it's literally like we want date in this format. Okay? Is it going to be like Monday, comma, September 14th, comma, 2019? Or is it going to be uh, 09, 15, 2019? Things like that would be in this section. So, congratulations! You've decided to make your content style guide. You heated my grammar nerdness. You went back to organization. You took a couple days. You made this beautiful four page document or site, whatever it is. The site would be better. It's public facing, and you, you have it. You're set. High school English teacher is proud. Your high school English teacher is proud. <laughs> yes, you used to be a high school English teacher. So <laughs> um, but then you think, oh, nobody is using my style guide. Things are still a mess. I don't know what's going on. I made this great job, and nobody cares. Right? But the answer, my friends, is that you have to put it into your CMS. Right? <laughs> the content style guide is a document for itself. It doesn't need to exist. But realistically, if the content authors are going to, to draw from it, as a resource to standardize and make consistent their content, it needs to be right there in line when they're editing that note, okay? 
Only the keeners like me are gonna load your four-page document and look at it, and I'm a rare breed. Okay, so you really need it right there. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Okay. Um, well done, Dave. <laughs> so I'm gonna confess how this presentation was born. Um, I was at the office one morning, and I'm at my desk, and I'm going to gather content, which Todd, Todd actually brought up for us, and there's a really great presentation tomorrow that's also going to talk about gather content that I'm excited to see. Um, I'm going through gather content, and I'm like, yo, Dave, have you seen this like awesome tool, and it's this content operations hub, and it just has all this neat functionality that really gets people thinking about content first, and you know, like, ah, oh, it's just, I wish we could like use this more. And I was going through like the things they do really well is collaborative authoring, maintaining consistent content, and custom creation and publication workflows. And I think a lot of this can be done in different ways, but the maintaining consistent content is really achieved in Gather Content by having these templates with text right below each field that outlines the ex writing expectations, the content style guide, if you will. So this one, for example, is a, is a headline. And I blew it up in blue font for you at the bottom here in case you can't read those scribbly black, but it says, you know, this, make this an H1, capitalize initials, and then it gives an example, keep it short and sweet, and use adjectives like exciting. Your high school English teacher is whispering in your ear as you're saying. It's fantastic. Okay? Um, there's another example in the next one, but we can sort of power through that. The secret sauce is help text. Drupal has help text, which is what Dave turned to me. He's like, Danielle. We can do this. Nobody does. I think okay. she was a little disappointed that I wasn't as impressed with Gather Content no. as she was. Dave was like, I can make most of this in Drupal. <laughs> no, we're not talking Gather Content, it has other use cases. But if you're in a position where your organization has an existing CMS, things aren't changing, you're not doing a redevelopment where you're going to decouple, like if you're already here, okay, you can just fix your help text and integrate your content style guide. The power struggle here is that most of the content authors or the communications individuals who care about these kind of things might not necessarily have the admin rights to go in and change that help text. So we want to think about empowering them to do that or prompting them to do that while we're in the development process or working with them. So really, I know it seems simple, but I'm here, me and Dave are here today to talk about help text um, as a simple way to support content authors and create a better user experience. So I'm going to ask Dave to uh, pick it up, pick it up from here, um, and he's going to take over from an implementation side. All right. So we'll talk about how this kind of taking these sort of principles and bringing them to Drupal and how that works. And uh, we sort of started, we built a, an example Drupal site out of this, and to keep, we wanted to keep things, or at least I wanted to keep things, as bare minimum as possible, so that we could, so we could really show that you could do that with really almost just Drupal core. So the theme is Barctic. So, because if you can do it in Barctic, you can do it anywhere else. So it's just Barctic with a little bit of styles. Um, so like we said, like one thing I, I observed is that Drupal already has almost everything we needed to make a really, a much better sort of content authoring experience and really bringing the content style guide into the content editing. Um, but, that's generally not how we configure it. And I can prove that probably you'd have never configured this with a bit of a quiz. Can you put help text on node titles? Has anyone put help text on node titles? I see one hand. You, you have? If it was an add-on plugin. That's right, because Drupal Core does not let you put help text on node titles. Um, which was shocked, which shocked me. I looked around for a help text field for it until finally I Googled it and the module no title help text came up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, our first step into uh, bringing the content style guide into Drupal is to start at the, at the data model. Um, and this really uh, goes back into our keynote um, where Todd talked about this. But we can bring the, the, style, the content style guide into the actual data model for uh, the node types and create fields and content types that reflect the way that we want the content to be written and do sort of guide users into writing good content. Um, and this means avoiding the generic fields that offer little or no guidance um, to users. So here's sort of an example of 
a bad node type that we've all created and used very heavily in Drupal versus a better one that actually helps you uh, or helps the, the, the person writing a, a large article um, write the article. So this is essentially a basic node. You have a title and then a box called body. And everything goes in body. And it's great, you have a WYSIWYG editor. There's nothing technically stopping you from writing articles this way. Um, but when you sit down to write an article this way, uh, you're really, you're on your own. Um, there's lots and lots of great resources to how to write an article out there, but they are not present. If we just sort of modify the data model for this kind of article, so our, our content type here is called narrative. We have another content type called good narrative, and instead of just a body field, we have multiple long text fields uh, that explain what we expect the author to write in them. Uh, it becomes a lot easier to write article content. Uh, and this is a very trivial change that Drupal usually does. Um, once we do this, we can create help text that's actually helpful. Most of the time, we don't fill out the help text and descriptions in Drupal. I know on a lot of sites that, that I see that other people have written, a lot of sites that I've written, um, there, there's a severe lack of, of help text. And we just sort of, well, the client asked for this content type with these sort of fields on it, so obviously they know what should go there. Um, but if we organize things for, with, to, uh, to line up with the content style guide, we can actually change help text um, to make it helpful and guide users through the authoring process. To make it less like opening Word and sitting down and having to write and getting a writer block and make it more like filling in a form to let you more quickly write much better content that's in line with the kind of content that um, the site's expecting that you, you write and publish. Um, yeah, so I have an example on the page instead of the body, this is what appears on the page. You could have the sort of inciting incident. And this is the moment where something goes wrong in the story. The protagonist of the story goes on a type of journey to right that wrong. That second one bit of help text really gives you a lot more context to what should go in that box than the first one. Um, the next thing that really helps you leverage um, your content style guide is paragraphs. Um, the concept of what paragraphs are has been around in Drupal for a while. Um, we've had field collections, um, which essentially do something very similar, an inline entity form uh, for doing that with entities. But all these things sort of let, you, let us wrap fields together to make sort of uh, sub pieces of content or content blocks uh, from the sort of. Uh, but what we can do with par paragraphs is we can actually leverage this to make them sort of wizards um, for filling in specific types of things that need to get added onto the site. Um, so we can create s smaller structures that get embedded into larger pieces of content. So if as an example, we can have, um, we can ask, we have a certain article type where users can fill out facts about what they, the, the subject of the article is. But, uh, it, that could either just be a text box, or we could make them do it in the body field, or we could use a paragraph called fact, and we could have every fact not only has to have the fact, but it also has to have a reference and require a URL with it. So we can package it together to, so that it may say in our content style guides, facts need to be referenced, but now we can force it by um, creating this structure as a paragraph. So. Uh, we implemented a bit of a SCA site, and uh, I guess you want to show them around? Oh, yeah, So sure. I think the, the whole subject of this presentation was to, uh, to get me to implement the site that I think teenage Danielle always wanted. Yeah, it existed. But yeah, so this is our, our, our Google uh, website called Why Can't We Be Friends. Um, it's a very small SCA repository right now, um, having to deal with you know, some of my favorite bands from high school. Um, that I guess would sort of give you a really quick overview. Hold on, let me um, zoom in, yeah, think. for sure. There we are. Yeah, that'll work. 
Let's go with let's go with the Aquabats for Todd because I know he was excited about them. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so we have this really sort of quick. Uh, this doesn't need to be Wikipedia. Wikipedia exists. So we have a quick photo, a link to Wikipedia in case you're really into the Aquabats and you want to know their entire life history. But otherwise, if I'm just trying to get you on board with like my musical excitement. Here's three quick facts about them, and then we just link to the YouTube videos. Um, but we're making sure, and Dave's going to sort of demo it later, that the writing expectations for these bullet points are right there as the author, author is editing. And this goes from everything to the capitalization expectations um, and the way that we're like referencing sources, right? Um, additionally, what was really interesting for me is I did write one article for the site, Why Can't We Be Friends, in defense of Scott, because I know everyone likes to make fun of Scott, it's a little bit weird. But I initially wrote, at one time point we had a content model that was just like a, in uh, exposition, conflict, right. resolution, right? So I wrote the first article with that sort of model, and then Dave changed the content type of me, and I was like, oh, I'll go move things around. And the article got so much better. It became so much more robust, and I'm like, I'm actually like weirdly proud of this piece of writing. Um, <laughs> because that content model really helped me develop it in a way that made it clear about every single thing that is necessary to make a good narrative. And while I'm writing it, I also know that if I'm going to use a song title, I have to be using quotation marks. If I'm going to mention an album title, it should be italicized. And it creates this nice standardization that's going to keep the reservoir of goodwill high and make you seem like a credible source. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's go take a look at the, uh, this is the end result of things. So uh, it sort of looks a little funny because uh, that's just, we're using Bartik. There's Bartik plus maybe 50 lines of CSS to do all this. So we just have standard node edit, and then um, we've sort of themed this page to really, really bring out the help text. And uh, my joke is that I called this um, Bartik content. Or did I call they it like gather, gather Bartik? Gather Bartik. There yeah. we go. <laughs> So, uh, so really all we did, this is, this is just some CSS that grabs the help text and, uh, and floats it left on us. Um, so that as we write it, here we have introduction and it tells us what, what is expected in the introduction. So we can add different paragraphs to write it, the, ins the inciting incident, crisis, climax, and then the resolution. And all these things are important in building the narratives on our articles. Um, and sure, we could do all this with just a body field and the WYSIWYG editor, um, but now we have a, we have a guide um, built into the, uh, the editing interface to walk people through creating the content. Um, and it's, uh, it's really not, wasn't difficult to implement at all, we just had to implement it. And one of the things I often hear from clients is that they're, they're really scared to disseminate content creation across the organization. Right? There becomes this fear of like, not everybody's going to write the same way. And that's true. It, it, it is a hurdle that needs to be considered. But if you can create these sort of user rules where you have this, this user rule that this is kind of all that they're getting, and they can't even necessarily publish it. They can just draft it at this level of thing, and they have the content style guide right there, that dissemination of, of content is going to be a lot cleaner and potentially meet the content style guide if it's right there for everyone, as opposed to there being two people in the comms department who are allowed to write anything because they're the only ones who know the content style guide, because it's in this two-page PDF that nobody looks at except for these two people who are grammar nerds, right? It, it makes that dissemination of content creation a little more feasible and a lot less scary. The really funny thing about this is uh, on the bus today, Matt handed Danielle... He's our, our other boss, uh, yeah. Uh, his laptop to write a quick article post for the uh, Drupal Camp Ottawa site. October 25th, 2019 in Ottawa! Right, right. <laughs> um, which was, of course, uh, just a title and a body. And I was like, that's awful. How are you supposed to write an article in that? <laughs> um, <laughs> And it just, it, it's sort of that moment where, you know, likely I will probably be the only one publishing to the Drupal Camp Ottawa site, October 25th, 2019. Um, <laughs> but if I were, have to share, were to share that responsibility with someone, because we do have a committee, right, and we wanted somebody else to write announcements, we could create a better content type so that when I make an announcement, or Dave makes an announcement, or Catherine makes an announcement, that we're all doing it the same style and tone. And it feels like the organization, as opposed to, Ugh, somebody wrote that one, and somebody wrote that one, and these guys seem to be some little organization who don't have their stuff together, right? It creates that, that reservoir of goodwill on a subconscious level for our users. Anything else you want to demo? No, I mean, 
I can show you more things about ska, but I've less draw on that than I thought I would. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, and so I wanted to, I kept this slide while we were writing the slides to keep a list of the contrib modules that I, I used to make the demo site. Um, it, didn't, it didn't get as long as I thought it would because you really, Drupal comes with everything you need. It's all about um, just rethinking the content authoring experience and breaking that down into the types of content. Um, and even while putting this together, I sort of, I have other things, in, I'm thinking, I've been thinking about other things for other sites that sort of specific types of writing. Um, that if you're writing something very targeted, break it down and break the components down into smaller sort of structured paragraph components and just sort of how easy that would be to sort of write something really complex with that. And I think there's just often a disconnect between the developers or the site builders who are making the site and the comms people in the organization. We don't get them in a room often enough. And all of these things probably exist. We just have to put them together and empower content authors. And I, I, I like it's, it's almost stupidly simple. That's right. it. Thank you very much. I now work in a comms department at an older website, and um, one thing I've always found useful when I'm making websites for the end users is um, instead of just putting in an image field or a paragraph um, type, I always put in some kind of help text, text. So for image fields, I always put the size as they know it that is preferred for that field. And it, it takes like minutes to figure out, okay, the optimum image in that space is, you know, yeah. 1280 by 420. So just put that in the image upload field as help text, mm -hmm. and then you never have to answer that question again. And I think image is one that does... I think image sure. does actually happen yeah. a lot, right? I think yeah. people do write image help text. I'm challenging you but, yeah. to write body help text, yeah. right? And, yeah. and it, it'll just shift things. And that's, for our new site, actually, we've got a lot of paragraphs, and we put that in, like, how to use each paragraph, right? mm -hmm. and that's helped a lot in letting people create their own stuff. Jason? That was good. I was wondering if you could have one minute to show us what the paragraph button and fact button looks like when you oh. actually use yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. totally. Because we, uh, I wanted to make sure to get time to questions, so I skip through. So, um, th this is my preferred. Paragraphs is like uh, all kinds of interfaces for how to use it. I like the buttons, um, but you can use another one. So if we want to add a focus quote, it'll just bring in so this all the fields for this. But I don't know why it's rendering so tiny, probably because my theming is bad. Um, there we go, this one looked a bit better. So. Um, a more interesting use of paragraphs is actually on the bands, on this site, uh, the band profiles. So um, if we go in here for fun facts, so we require one fun fact, so we have a fact and uh, the reference for it, and we can add facts. Um, and then we have songs, where are the links for the songs? Something broke. Something broke, all right, that's fine. So, yeah, here we go. We can add another fact. And there we are. Yeah. Um, so you can add many and you can reorder them, but at least you're getting this structure each time. Yeah, and the thing too is uh, I've kind of mangled Barctic for this theme to bring out the help text. So, uh, so the rendering is a little bit off. But I mean, it's more I just wanted to show that if we could do this like in Barctic without touching anything, then you can definitely do it in your themes. I'll, I'll let you pick well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm on the developer side and I generally do add description text. Oh, excellent. It annoys me when people don't. Yeah. Um, the biggest issue I've encountered is that people creating the content don't read it. <laughs> yeah. So that's the one thing that, that's the thing about, uh, like, the thing that gather content really, or looking at gather content and their content interface that really was like, oh, like, Drupal doesn't do that, is that, um, Gather content when you're writing content makes the help text like the thing you see first. You don't get a box to type in. 
Like that's not the focus of what you see. The box detection is there, but it is it is gives you the instructions and then the box. And so that's just sort of what I tried to I tried to reproduce. And I think like that is really sort of a, a helpful thing. Um, and I never really thought to theme it that way, even though it's like kind of trivial. Yeah, I mean, I literally didn't think about it either. We did have like twelve. That's actually pretty small. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even come up with that. It was sort of, it was a, it was sort of, how, like really, really like funny how easy this was to implement, and like how much easier this sort of site gets to write content for. Um, and, and when you're logged in as an admin user, you do have that itty bitty help text that people are probably going to ignore. I'm not going to yeah. lie, right? So you do have to spend a little bit of time doing what Dave did here um, to put it in people's faces. And, and it especially becomes important in that content dissemination model, right? We have lots of people writing different content. Um, if it's just like, you know, three people on the comms team, they might actually pay attention to help text in the admin login. Um, but by theme, it out the way that Dave did, which he said was a couple of lines of CSS code, or like, yeah, no, it's really like, well, I mean, I wouldn't advise using Bark Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Just to prove a point. Show we good. So, oh yeah, now let's get to add content. Yeah. Yeah, everyone knows the site password now. <laughs> what else? That's okay. So yeah, so just to, to remind you, this is sort of what it looks like uh, in 7. Uh, the interface that everyone's going to be more familiar with. And you're right, it's tiny, it's light gray, it's easily, easy to work <coughs> Yeah, and then if we start adding stuff here, like, it is gone. Yeah. Like, Drupal by itself doesn't, um, doesn't really, like, think that much of help text. I think the best example is that, like, the title field, probably the most important field on the node, doesn't even give you a place for it. Whereas, like, just a little bit of theming, and you can sort of make that part of the workflow in terms of writing the content. And I think as we end up in a more decoupled world, you know, you're going to have places that are going to do this. But if you're if you're stuck on Drupal core, right, and you still want to make this happen in your organization, this is a simple fix. Sure. Sure. Hey. Um, yeah. I guess there's two of you stacked right in a row. So you <laughs> fight it out. Good. I just wondered why you didn't choose uh, seven. We usually, when we want to do any kind of a feature, we uh, I, I figured seven would because so Bartek is way out here. <laughs> <laughs> Initially, I was pushing Dave. I was like, let's theme this and make it pretty. And Dave was like, no, street cred, no, Bartek. Like, <laughs> no, no, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, not necessarily, it's not about street cred. It's more about lowest common denominator. Like, you, like let's say you have, um, you have users that can log in to like, put in comments. They generally aren't. Go they're not going to be able to see. They're not going to be able to see Bartek, or they're, sorry, they're not going to be able to see setting your admin theme. But you can still give them this interface because you can see if you can do it to Bartek, and if you can do it to Bartek, I mean, you can do it to any other thing. So that that was that was why I chose it. So are you using it for both the front and the back end Bartek, and don't yeah, no, 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 no,
if we cannot do this, we're talking about having it as a PDF or as pages on the side, how do you let your content editors review this as part of um, as part of like their routine thing if it's not in front of them all the time? You were talking that you you're the one of the rare people who would open the that style on the side and compare it. But for a normal person, normal content editor, a, a staff, normal staff at a company, mm -hmm. how do you quote unquote force them to, to use that style? Culture. <laughs> right? Like, and, and, and it's perfect. You just hit at the bottom part of the content strategy quad, right? It's about the people as opposed to the technology. Um, so my answer is one word, but it's very complex. And your situation is extremely complex. I don't know that this is the answer for you. Yeah. Um, but if you have none of this right now, even if you can, I know all those content style guides are competing 100%, but if you can sort of pull out their, their basic components, like sentence, ta t sentence case versus title case, right? And you can just clean that up for your users, that'll help. Okay? I know that's like a really vague answer, but it, that's another talk. I had, I had a client recently where I was pitching them basically integrating the style guide, because they must have, based on how much public we do, had a style guide. And I, I was pitching them, let's, let's get the style guide into the content management system, because they had a lot of people writing for this site. And they were basically like, oh, we used to have a style guide. But like, in reality, every article we're writing is totally subjective, and, no, and, we, and we don't even follow it, so we don't have one. And it's like, all right, well, by field it is then, because yeah. we can't enforce anything, because you don't want to. But like, there's, only, there's only so many, there's only so much you can do. You need to have people on board. So like, it really is a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Like, they, what if if everyone is on board and making their lives significantly easier, then you can do it. But otherwise, like, there's there's some things you can't change. But uh, best of luck. That's our time, so we're gonna cut yeah. it. Well, no, we have oh. questions. Do we? How are we? We have 15 minutes. Do so. we? Are we good for time on the schedule? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll answer the, the question. Okay. So. Feel free to like. Is it very back over there? Um, going back to content strategy. So I am coming from the designer side of things. Yeah. Um, the site we're working on right now, uh, is the content is mostly supposed to be contributed by the community. Mm -hmm. um, but there, like, there's a resources section, and there probably should be some consistency in how those resources are set up. Mm -hmm. um, so content strategy, like if we have user personas or user should those be used to also build the content strategy or are those totally separate things? How varied are your, are your user profiles? Like are they are they sort of super niche and you sort of have three different versions of, of mostly the same person or do you have very different different user personas? Currently there is no UX strategy, so I totally agree. Okay. okay. Come chat with me. Um because I have a different answer for both of those two situations. Alright, and Bexler and then we'll uh no, oh, sir. So right now there's an in and UI redo for Drupal. Yeah. But I don't know if they're necessarily looking at this type of thing. So, um, yeah. what would you say to that team after you look at gathered content? And so the, the thing is, uh, and why it's sort of a bit more subjective than that, is Drupal gets used for lots and lots of very, very things. Um, and not all of them are going to necessarily benefit or be compatible with this, but the things that are, um, we can leverage what we have in Drupal to make much better content management systems um, for in those in those cases. So it's that kind of thing may or may not be a hard sell to like a UX redesign that isn't specifically for authoring content like that. Um, but I mean, it, it, definitely like there's some good ideas that we should that we. Uh, we should steal from. I mean, Drupal is like is turning into like a content hub. Yeah. Like, especially with eight. So would you say you know, and a lot of the and mid UI has a lot of inertia from previous versions of Drupal. So I don't know, maybe it's something to think about. Well, I'm an old Drupal dog, so I like would say that should, that belongs in Contrib, but uh, <laughs> but I think that's not the current mentality. So I don't know. Thanks for your time, everyone. It's a blast.